This video is sponsored by Movie Palette. Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Harrison Ford is back as Indiana Jones in one last adventure as he hunts for the Dial of Destiny. In 1969, Indiana Jones, played by Harrison Ford, is retiring as a professor when he's visited by his goddaughter Helena Shaw, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, asking about Archimedes' Dial of Destiny, which her late father Basil, played by Toby Jones, a friend of Indiana's, was obsessed with. But Helena is pursued by a group of government agents, led by Seanette Renee Wilson's Mason, who are aiding Jürgen Voller, played by Mads Mikkelsen, a former Nazi scientist working for NASA, who wants the dial for himself. Determined to stop the dial falling into the wrong hands and try to save Helena, Indiana steps into adventure one last time. 42 years after the original Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones is back again for one last adventure in the Dial of Destiny, which arrives 15 years after Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which itself was 19 years after the Indiana Jones movie before that. It's kind of frightening to think the decade plus long gap between these two blazed sequels is almost equal to each other because it certainly doesn't feel that way. But nevertheless, I didn't see the original Indiana Jones movies when they first came out because obviously I wasn't born yet. Like many of my generation, they were kind of childhood staples. I caught up with the indie movies in my teens, and certainly by the time that Crystal Skull came out, I was very well acquainted with the franchise, and like everyone else, I was hugely hyped for it and then kind of let down when it came out. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I was actually one of the people that defended it at the time of its release, but I've got to be brutally honest, it has not aged well, and all the things that were problems back then, like the fridge, or the monkeys, or the bloody UFO, and all that gubbins, yeah, it's all still problems now, especially considering you've got the added layer of Shia LaBeouf to it on top of that. So certainly, Crystal Skull was a bit of a downer ending to the franchise in general, and I feel like Ford kind of felt the same way. Ford has really been pushing for another Indiana Jones movie for quite some time. But perhaps the biggest issue with Crystal Skull is it didn't feel like Spielberg's heart was truly in it, and that wasn't really his fault. I feel like he's kind of gotten to a point now where he can't really truly replicate the films that he made back then, he's kind of aged out of it. It's perhaps unsurprising that Dar Destiny is the first Indiana Jones movie that isn't directed by Steven Spielberg, who instead gets an executive producer credit on this outing, along with the other creator of Indiana Jones, George Lucas, who I believe didn't have that much involvement with Crystal Skull, but here has no involvement whatsoever aside from the credit. Stepping into the director's chair this time around is James Mangold, probably best known for the 310 to Yuma remake, along with Logan and Le on 66. Mangold has made a lot of well-received movies, but certainly he wouldn't be the first on your mind when you're picking someone that is supposed to be a Spielberg successor or someone that has been influenced by him. And so there was a little bit of questions regarding this as to whether it would feel like an Indiana Jones movie, especially considering that Harrison Ford is himself creeping up in age. Does this Indiana Jones film manage to deliver or at least wash out the taste of Crystal Skull? It does, but it is a bit of a mixed bag in of itself. The film begins with a prologue set in the final days of World War II, where Indiana Jones is in yet another scrape with the Nazis, this time trying to rescue Basil Shaw, who is Helena's father, who has been captured by them. And this is the sequence that features the much vaunted de-aging process, supposedly to bring Harrison's age back now to how he was in the original films made in the 80s. And certainly I'd imagine that this was extremely technically complicated, I believe a new process was actually made for Dial of Destiny where they culled extensively from footage of Harrison in the original Indiana Jones movies and basically did face replacement so that it kind of matched his expressions for each shot. Either way though, it's not quite there. This has always been the problem with de-aging in that even in the best examples, it still doesn't feel quite 
real. The eyes are always a bit of a giveaway in this regard. I mean, it's probably the best that I've seen it in this movie, certainly up there with Kurt Russell in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. And there are some shots in Dire Destiny which are near perfect. Any time that Ford is kind of off angle to the camera, it kind of starts looking a little bit weird, especially. But there's also the fact that even if you do plaster on a younger face, it's still 80-year-old Harrison Ford under there. He's still going to sound older. He's still going to move a little bit differently. Ford has actually kept himself in really great shape, and it shows all across the rest of the movie. The thing is, though, there's only so much that technology can accomplish. However, if you can get past all of that, I actually thought that this opening sequence did a great job of recapturing the spirit of the original Indiana Jones movies, this entire opening stretch, particularly when they're on the train, seething at the fact that he has to kind of move through a train of Nazis. And then, of course, you've got the big gag with the turret gun and the train going around the corner. That felt like Indiana Jones for me in a way that maybe even Kingdom of the Crystal Skull never truly managed to do, it felt like in some ways the movie had managed to turn back the clock. There is meant to be a very deliberate contrast in that we get that younger version of Indiana Jones and reminds us specifically of that fact before the movie jumps into its own present of 1969. Almost like Indiana in this movie is remembering his own past, remembering his own adventures, the ones that he used to take. Indiana Jones in this movie is growing up to be a grumpy old man, someone that feels out of step with the world around him, which has changed radically. He's an old-fashioned adventurer in the era of the moon landings. People aren't interested in excavating the past, they're interested in exploring the skies and the moon. That is where science is leading. But Indiana is still focused on history, not just in general, but his own. He's thinking about his adventures past and the fun that he used to have, and thinking that he doesn't really have a place in the this world anymore. At his retirement party, he's given a timepiece as a leaving present, which of course has major significance because the MacGuffin of this movie is a timepiece itself. But Indiana refuses to be consigned to history and just quickly gives away the timepiece as soon as he leaves. I feel like these ideas aren't necessarily new to Dial of Destiny. They were actually ideas in Crystal Skull, where again, Indiana felt like a man kind of out of time against the atomic age. In Crystal Skull, that got lost a lot of the time, especially in the second half of the movie, whereas Dial of Destiny makes this the focal point of the entire narrative. It's all about that passage of time. It's all about being older. Should Harrison Ford be making Indiana Jones movies at the age of 80? Probably not, but that's more of a symptom of the fact that we keep looking back to our stars of the past instead of making new ones to fill their place. And there's a huge market for traction movies with aging action stars. And Ford is right up there with Sylvester Stallone, who is also making action movies in his 80s now, but even he is taking a step back from the latest Expendables film. But Ford completely throws himself into the role as usual. Ford is a huge reason why the movie works. You can't separate Indiana Jones from Harrison Ford. The two are one and the same. I know that some people have asked, well, why didn't they recast him for the prologue instead of going through that de-aging stuff? The thing is, who plays Indiana Jones better than Harrison Ford? I will take the compromise there than having another actor in that part, especially because this is a farewell performance. You can tell all throughout it that Ford is kind of wrapping things up for the character, someone that has aged along with many members of the audience. There is that resonance there from having someone older in that role. And considering the physicality of the movie, I thought they integrated Ford really well. Yes, a lot of the stunt pieces are very vehicle focused because obviously you're not going to have someone like Ford running around for a lot of the movie, but he still does a lot of quite physical work in the movie, although we do have to stress that there is a lot of stunt doubling there. There is a lot of CG face replacements and just general masks as well. So obviously a lot of that isn't Harrison, but 
in most movies, it probably isn't the stars doing those stunts anyway. But it also helps that Ford has great chemistry with Phoebe Waller-Bridge. The relationship between Indiana and his goddaughter Helena is the bedrock of this movie. When you first think of Indiana Jones, you might consider the big action set pieces as being the most major component of these movies, but humour and wit is also crucial to them, and Waller-Bridge brings a lot of that. The relationship between Indiana and Helena is quite complicated because it's more of a surrogate father and daughter relationship. Her father, Basil, was quite absent a lot of the time. He was so fixated on the dial, he kind of left his daughter behind, and Indiana stepped in to fill the gap a lot of the time. Indiana refers to her as Wombat quite affectionately, especially in the earlier portions of of the movie, and so he kind of still sees her a lot like a child, and then she reveals that she has a lot more dimension to her. In a lot of ways, Helena is kind of amoral in terms of her characterization. In fact, it kind of draws a little bit from Indiana himself in his younger days, especially when you think of kind of Temple of Doom era, where he's a lot more kind of fortune and glory than trying to bring things into a museum like his older self is usually trying to. She's very much more about trying to get the dial as something to sell on the black market, and so you're not quite entirely sure where her allegiances lay. She gets into a lot of trouble, and there is a lot of Marion in terms of her personality, in that she's a little bit reckless, but she knows how to handle herself when she gets in a spot of trouble, and so that makes the character interesting, but over the course of the movie, she does reveal that she does have some kind of ethics, she does have some kind of code, even if she doesn't show it at first, she's very good at kind of manipulating situations to her own advantage. I love the dialogue between the two characters, it's very playful the whole time. It actually reminded me a lot of Last Crusade, and I mean that in a good way, especially because there are certain elements that call back to that movie thematically, the ideas of kind of parental abandonment, feeling like they're more interested in the past than they are in the present, and the fact that this father-daughter dynamic kind of is a reversal of how it was in that movie, in that Indiana has almost become his father in a lot of ways. He becomes someone that tags along on this adventure, and he's kind of along for the ride, and that Helena is kind of the one that's driving the action in certain portions of the movie. Again, that kind of harkens back to the idea of aging, that kind of circular idea going on through the whole of this movie. And I, I liked the fact that there were those kind of callbacks spiritually without having having to constantly having to have references to the earlier movies explicitly, or just being a full-on stealth remake, which this isn't. It's trying to be its own thing with echoes from the past, and that means that its callbacks feel much more earned and relevant, even when it comes to characters from earlier installments like John Reese davies Salah, who again is largely there for an extended cameo that refers back to the film's core theme of aging and change. But Indy isn't the only one looking back to the past. He's mirrored in the film's villain of Jürgen Voller, who he first encounters on the train, and clearly Voller has been keeping a grudge against Indy for two decades ever since. And Mads Mikkelsen is perfectly cast in this role. He's great at playing villains. He added a lot of dimension to the Sheaf in Casino Royale or Hannibal in the television series. Here he's not really called upon to do that because he's just playing straight up evil. But Mickelson is a great face to sneer at. And Vaughn is obsessed with trying to change the past. He's resentful about the fact the Nazis lost the war. He wants to use the dial to try and fix that. And there is a real really interesting element with the character of Vol in that he is a NASA scientist who worked on the aforementioned moon landing, and this of course refers back to the real-life Operation Paperclip, where many German scientists were given new identities to work on on the rocket launch. And so there is that kind of political element there, which is amplified by the fact that he's working with a CIA agent played by Seanette Rene Wilson. That character is meant to be the sort of person that infiltrated the Black Panthers. Both of them are useful to the government 
until they're deemed not, at which point they're expendable. The problem is the movie has no time to explore that idea in any real detail or in any kind of substance, and the way it gets boiled down in the final result, it just ends up being an extremely obvious double cross that you can guess pretty much the moment these two characters share screen time, especially because the reintroduction to Vola is him being clearly racist and antagonistic to a black member of hotel staff, so Clearly you know how things are going to go down in this dynamic at some point. But what you want to see from an Indiana Jones movie is the set pieces and adventure, and Dial of Destiny delivers on that front right from the outset with that prologue, which is pretty much three action set pieces back to back, not just the train, but also you've got a sidecar chase in there as well, both of which feel like their own callbacks to Last Crusade, and each of them are thrilling in their own right. They're genuinely nail-biting in the way that you would expect an Indiana Jones set piece to be, but also they have that kind of dark, macabre humour of seeing Nazis get absolutely decimated by a gun on the side of a train, and that continues later on into the first two acts of the movie. There's that big Big chase on Moon Day, which goes all through the parade, and then into the subway tunnels where Indiana is riding on a horse and he's trying to outrun the subway carriages, and that was also something that genuinely had me on the edge of my seat. It was really rollicking stuff, but I feel like the best stretch of the movie is that entire section in Tangier. Just absolutely brilliant from start to finish, especially that lengthy three-way car chase where they're trying to catch up with Vara, but Helena has people who are coming after her, and you've got people diving in and out of vehicles, lots of close calls and escapes. Really excellently done. My main problems with Adara Destiny is that it feels overwritten and overbaked. It's trying to do too many things at the same time, and it really needed another draft to maybe consolidate down the script, maybe merge characters or drop certain events, because it feels a little bit unwieldy in its final form. There are subplots that get no resolution by the conclusion. Chief among these is a minor subplot where Indiana Jones gets framed for murder, and this is meant to be a major character motivation to clear his name. The problem is, by the time the ending of the movie is rolled around, it's completely forgotten about it. And I don't know why this happened. Maybe it was the result of merging several scripts together or rewrites. If it wasn't eliminated at the writing stage, it should have been caught at the editing stage. They should have realized this doesn't actually go anywhere. Let's just cut it out entirely. There's a whole section of the movie where Indy meets up with an old friend, a diver played by Antonio Banderas, and that stretch of the movie kills a lot of the pacing stone dead. First of all, it is a major waste of Antonio Banderas. Banderas is a hugely charismatic presence. He was made to be in an Indiana Jones movie. He was bloody Zorro, but he's almost wasted as much here as he was in Indy ripoff last year, Uncharted. I don't understand why you would cast Banderas in what is basically a secondary periphery role that could have been played by virtually anyone. He barely has any lines or does anything. He's in the movie for about 10 minutes or so. He probably only accepted because he wanted to be in an Indiana Jones movie. That's precisely the reason, regardless of the part, but he should have demanded far more from it. But also, this goes into a lengthy underwater sequence. The Curse of Thunderball strikes here. Something about underwater sequences is cinematic inertia, and this lengthy sequence feels like it was really expensive to accomplish, but also doesn't really forward the plot in many significant ways. It kind of feels like it's just kind of there to fill out time, bloat which the movie doesn't really need, and then, concluding this particular stretch of the movie, there's not one, not two, but three big expository speeches back to back with each other, just in case we hadn't ruined the full momentum anymore. Mangold in his movies, especially recently, has taken a quite leisurely approach to pacing. Logan and Le Mans 66 are two and a half hour movies, and they're quite long, slow movies. They're deliberately paced. That's not an Indiana Jones pacing, though. Mangold has recently 
Disney said they asked Spielberg what advice he had for directing an Indiana Jones movie, and Spielberg told him, you're gonna make something that's paced like a trailer. No scene lasts longer than 30 seconds. It's always gotta be constantly moving. And I feel like Mangold should have taken that advice more to heart. It's by far the longest Indiana Jones movie at two and a half hours. All of Spielberg's entries are roughly around the two hour mark. That is the sweet spot, and Destiny shows why that is. There's simply too many things that are just flagging down the pacing, and Spielberg knew that the economics of pace outweighed maybe a few potential story holes. The greatest example of this is in Raiders of the Lost Ark, where we had an entire expository scene that explained why Indy knew to keep his eyes shut at the end of the movie when the arc is opened. But that got cut. The movement of the movie meant that the audience probably wasn't asking that question at that particular moment, because they were wrapped up in the story. Whereas Dial has too many stretches where the pacing dies down and you get to fixate on all the stuff that maybe doesn't make total sense in the moment. And that means that that stretch of the movie unfortunately weighs down a lot of the third act, especially once we head to Greece. That stretch of the movie is meant to be kind of classic Indiana Jones tomb raiding, caverns with creepy crawlies and solving puzzles, but it all feels a little bit perfunctory. It all feels a little bit kind of routine. That's partially in the execution and partially because we're kind of exhausted out by that point. There's also a certain kind of grit to the original trilogy that's kind of lacking in Dial, and I'm not just talking about the visual look of the movie, which is very clean, and that's largely symptomatic of modern movie blockbusters, in that everything is so post-processed now and so tweaked that even the stuff they did actually film in camera somehow feels fake. That isn't totally to do with Dial, and that was an issue in Crystal Skull as well, and at least Dial does manage to compensate by feeling more like an Indiana Jones movie, but I'm talking about the fact that those original movies had proper horror elements to them. They were the kind of films that traumatised children. They had people's faces melting off, or having their hearts ripped out, or heads exploding. That kind of stuff. When you go see an Indiana Jones movie, you want to see Nazis get obliterated in gruesome, but kind of classy ways. And it feels like that kind of has been lost in this Disney movie. And it's weird to say that this Indiana Jones film is opened by a Disney logo, but it does feel like it has had the edges kind of softened on it. Luckily, the film does manage to regain some momentum in time for its big finish, or at least it did for me, which is absolutely bonkers. And I know that this is something that is going to no doubt divide viewers, that some viewers will probably think it's a little bit too far, it's a little bit too out of left field. But for me, it works, especially because the film has very clearly signaled what direction it's heading in, but not the how. And certainly when it reveals that, that was a nice pleasant surprise for me. And I suddenly went, oh, I'm seeing something I genuinely didn't expect to see when I came into this. And it's completely wild. And it kind of feels like it's still within the realm of what this franchise entails. The big problem with Crystal Skull's MacGuffin is it leaned really heavily into sci-fi, which kind of felt like it was at odds with the whole Indiana Jones vibe in general. Dial's MacGuffin sort of leans into that sci-fi territory as well, but the way that it's handled feels much more fantastical, and that means that it feels much more in keeping with the spirit of Indiana Jones, the kind of face of the villains kind of being this big, fantastical bit of hubris on their part. So yes, the ending of the movie is silly, but it's in an entertaining way, and that includes the random incidental character that just happens to get sucked up into this madness. I would love to know what his particular story is, you know, trying to explain what happened to him as a character. I think because it ties back in with the themes of the movie and actually brings some resolution to Indy in some ways, I feel like the film kind of earns that particular payoff. But again, your perspective might vary, and certainly Indiana Jones does bring a lot of opinions out of people. What I will say, though, is the actual final scene of this movie 
brings things at least back to a human level, which is nice to see. And it's not just a cheap callback, it does actually feel emotionally satisfying as well. So that even if you're left somewhat cold by the big finish of this movie, the fact they actually brought it back to the characters at the core of this series, the main reason why it's successful, not the action, that is actually surprisingly poignant. And if this is the final installment for the character, it feels like a much more fitting end to hang his hat on. I went into Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny not expecting something up to the original trilogy of films. Far too much time has passed, but also those are three of the best blockbusters ever made, made by one of the greatest directors of all time. And Mangold isn't Spielberg. But even so, there are moments where the spark of those movies is truly captured. At its high points, Dial lives up to those movies, even though it is a messier film overall. It is too long, it needed a rewrite, and it needed to make better use of its supporting cast, but it's also a way better film than Crystal Skull, even though arguably the two movies have very similar readings of Indiana Jones as an older adventurer, it's just that Dial is a much better film. I was entertained by Dial of Destiny. It was a nice step back into the past for a little bit, and certainly, as a farewell to the character, it's a much better resolution overall. It's not going to stand on the same level as those original three films, because it never could, but as an addendum, certainly, it's entertaining in its own right, if flawed. You've probably seen this in the background of the video and thought, it belongs in a museum! Actually, it belongs on your wall. This is a movie palette. It takes your favorite movies and turns them into a piece of art with a whole range of titles available, including the earlier Indiana Jones movies. But in this case, this is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. And if you would like a treasure of your own, then go to moviepalette.com and use the code FILMBRAIN15 to get 15% off your order. Trust me. If you like this review and you want to support my work, you can give me a tip at my Ko-fi page or my YouTube Super Thanks feature, which is right below the video. Or you can buy some of my merch, my T Public page. Or you can whip on over to my Patreon, where you can see my videos early, among other perks, including access to my Discord server. Or you can simply like, share, and subscribe. Those all help as well. Until next time, I'm Matthew Burke, fading out.